Um, I give presentations like this quite a bit, actually. Um, I'm a sort of resident expert on Gandhi at the University of Texas, and so I get asked, especially by high school history classes and um, various different volunteer organizations, to come out and explain what you know the story of Gandhi is and how did India win its independence. And the problem is, is that um, most people are unprepared for what I'm going to say about Gandhi, which is almost everything that you know about the man, his life, and the, what actually won India's independence is not in fact true. Um, that there's a more complicated story about the way that India wins its independence, which should force us all to rethink the story about the centrality of nonviolent politics for social change and what that relationship might be. Um, let me lay out for you, just at least at the beginning, what the big myths are about Gandhi. Um, the first is that Gandhi, uh, a man uh, committed to some principled moral beliefs, um, and his f steadfast determination to be nonviolent led an entire country and freed India on the basis of his nonviolent struggle. That is a myth. I'll hope to debunk that in the 45 minutes that I'm up here talking. The second myth is that it was these nonviolent politics that convinced the leadership in England that they ought to give India its independence. Um, turns out to be the case that England tried very ruthlessly to hold on to its power in India, despite some of the most spectacular nonviolent resistance campaigns led by the Indians. But I'll, I'll go into that as well. The third myth, um, and I think the most important one, because it's going to take me the most work to sort of explain to you uh, why it's a myth, is that the movement for India's independence was in fact nonviolent. Um, there's actually quite a bit of violence that takes place in India. Um, in fact, when Gandhi comes to that comes to prominence in India, he's attempting, in fact, to put down a wing of Indian nationalism, which were called the extremists, um, basically engaged in terrorist activity, uh, blowing up train stations and attacking the police and military installations in Bengal and in Bombay. Um, that the movement, in fact, had a number of a, a number of different environmental components to it. Now, I raised that at the beginning just so that you're prepared for this to be a kind of non-standard version of the story. Um, it's not the one that the Attenborough film starring Ben Kingsley does. Um, it's not the version that you get in history textbooks. And so occasionally it can be a little unsettling to get this version of it. But I, I feel like it's important to talk about what happens in India so that as, real, as activists or as people who are considering being activists, we can ask what parts of the story are useful for our current activist campaigns and what <coughs> aspects of the story are not as useful. Um, every time I give this talk um, to my undergraduates or to other you know, um, sort of civil uh, 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 groups that are working on social justice campaigns, um, everybody thinks that being critical of Gandhi is something like being mean to a puppy or making fun of Jesus. And uh, that is not my intention. My intention is not to do either of those things. I like puppies. I think Jesus was an okay guy. But I have no reason to sort of do this for the sake of doing this. But I do think that it's important that we ask these questions because if it's not true that India got its independence on the basis of nonviolence, if it's not true that um, Gandhi led the movement for um, India's independence, uh, by the time it gets its independence, Gandhi's actually not at the leadership. If those two things are not true, then it should force us to reconsider why and how and under what circumstances we take to nonviolent social uh, civil disobedience tactics and whether or not we have to become a bit more flexible in thinking about them. Now, my thinking about this has undergone quite a bit of change from two aspects. The first is that my dissertation and my uh, you know, graduate research was all on Gandhi, so you uncover a whole bunch of archival material about what the movement for independence looked like. But the second reason that it's undergone change is that I've been involved now in a number of campaigns for social justice. Um, I was part of the anti-war movement um, in this country against the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq, and now the sort of ongoing drone campaigns in Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, if you will. I've been part of the movement to end sweatshop labor. I was actually on the coordinating committee of the United Students Against Sweatshops. Um, I've been part of the global justice um, movement. I helped start a trade union at UC Berkeley when I was there. I helped my trade union when I was So you name it, social justice campaigns. I've tried to get involved in them as much as possible. And the one thing that um, repeatedly comes up is what is going to be necessary if we're going to change um, the pervasive you know, arrangement economically, politically, and socially, which exists, which perpetrates uh, nonviolence. I have never seen half a million people protest against the war before it happened the way that I did in 2003. It never has happened uh, before. Historically, the mass nonviolent campaigns against the war um, that occurred globally, nothing that kind has ever happened in human history. And yet, that many people nonviolently, peacefully on the streets were unable to persuade the American government that the war in Iraq was wrong. So we have to ask the question of what exactly it will take beyond 
uh, what we did, which was the biggest, biggest simultaneous global demonstration against the war, which forces those people who run uh, the most brutal empire now in the world um, to change their minds. Because if we want to stop the wars as they're ongoing, um, we're going to have to figure that question out. What I want to argue um, about is why, first, we like the Gandhi story, because I'm not interested in, in calling us dupes of some mythology. I think there's a real reason why the idea that a nonviolent campaign um, could win is a persuasive campaign, uh, a persuasive story. It has real resonances for us. Um, and that's because I think we like the idea of individuals standing up on the basis of their convictions with clear moral imperatives and speaking truth to power and that having some transformative capacity. I think we like the idea that you know the poorest of the poor in India could come out into the streets or manufacture salt and it had you know the British government quaking in their boots to see this kind of uh, political theater and spectacle happen. I also think we like the idea um, that we can um, get to a better world without ourselves um, uh, engaging in some uh, 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 dirty uh, 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 dirty things. Uh, those things all are part of the reason why this is persuasive. But I want to argue that there's a more sinister reason why this argument is persuasive. Um, and it has to do with the ways that um, we are taught, uh, I think in classroom settings, um, and by people in positions of power, that nonviolence is the only way that we ought to advocate for change. Um, and in fact, that is a story that we are given. That's the Martin Luther King story. It's a Cesar Chavez story. It's the Nelson Mandela story. Um, despite the fact that in each of those campaigns, the Farm Workers Union, American Civil Rights Struggle, um, the struggle to end apartheid in South Africa, violence was a part of that move, of all of those movements. And yet the narrative that we're given in American textbooks is about nonviolence. And there's a reason for that. Um, the first reason for that has to do with the fact that it's designed to uh, persuade people who want radical social change that the problem is their lack of commitment to nonviolence and not the violence that is used against them by the people in the halls of power. So it forces a kind of internalized discussion about the failed morality of people engaged in political activism as opposed to a discussion about what are the real um, mechanisms, uh, things that are done by the state. Uh, Professor Hammond here was at Kent State, Ohio in the 60s, if you're familiar with the sort of fight um, uh, around SDS in the 1960s and 1970s, you know the consequences of that at Kent State. Um, it forces us not to ask the question of what kind of military and police violence will they use to defend their power, but then turns the question on us internally. The second one is it begins a process of tactical straitjacketing. Now, I'm on film, so I'm not going to say anything, well, I wouldn't say it anyway, to encourage anybody to take up more militant action in the kinds that would encourage violence. But what I am saying is that we have to be honest as, a, as activists and thinkers about what it is that the state uh, the police, the military are willing to do. They've been bombing now in Pakistan with impunity. They know that the killings of civilians to supposed militants is like 10 to 1. They know they're killing innocent people, and yet no amount of moral suasion has been able to persuade the Obama administration that that's a bad thing. And the last and final reason is that I think that it is the story about nonviolence is designed to convince us that the reason we don't succeed as a movement is because we are not pious, humble, meek, um, uh, subservient enough that we do not we do not uh, uh, flagellate ourselves enough for a lack of, uh, of moral commitment, um, and not because the state or uh, empire or uh, the powers that be are willing to hold on to power, property, and, emp and empire at any cost. And that 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 sort of moral equation forces it back on onto the individual, as opposed to us thinking about these sorts of systemic problems. Okay. So now that I've laid that out. Um, we should start asking some questions. Um, we should start asking the first question, which is, what do we do with politics if nonviolence doesn't tell the entirety of the story of how some of the most impressive civil rights struggles were run in this country? They weren't simply campaigns for nonviolence. Then what else do we need to talk about to understand how those processes uh, uh, advance? And then secondly, we need to ask ourselves, what kind of social justice do we want which imagines a world free of the kinds of violence and oppressions and you know, economic exploitations that we understand go on in the world today? Before I get there, though, I want to I want to I want to tell you um, a little bit about why the Gandhi story uh, is at least mildly contradictory from the outset. And then I'm going to try to lay out for you as best as I can 100 years of Indian history in 20 minutes, um, you know, to get to like sort of the meaty bits of Professor Hammond is laughing because he knows that we do. You know, that's not even a semester worth of Chinese history. You can't do 100 years in, in any, you know in a full semester. But we'll try to do it in 20 minutes. 
There are two problems with the Gandhi story, aside from the myths that if you know what happens in India, um, should lead you to, to conclude that the Gandhi mythology is purely mythology. And the first one is that if you want to credit Gandhi uh, with the movement for India's independence, that he leads it, that it's his politics that are at the heart of it, that the things that he says and does enable independence to happen, you also have to leave at Gandhi's feet some of the blame for the partition of India that happens at the same moment as independence, which is probably, at the time, the largest um, ethnic cleansing campaign that happened. Some 17 million Hindus and Muslims are evicted from their homes in North India and Pakistan and forced to move to other sides of the border in partition. Over a million people die in the bloody violence that emerges in 1947. Uncounted numbers of women are raped in sort of retaliatory violence in this period as well. So if you want to credit Gandhi with sort of the glorious nonviolent independent strategy, you also have to give him some of the blame for what emerges at that time of independence. The second problem with the Gandhian story, and this is the one that I don't, even the Attenborough film doesn't do a really good job of this, is that the closer you get to independence, the more irrelevant Gandhi actually is to the politics of India. Um, nobody's listening to him anymore. He's not at the negotiating table anymore. He's been iced out of positions in the Congress party. He's also in his 70s, so it's not entirely his fault that he's not as big a player in the Indian political um, um, scene at the time. But he, he becomes less and less of a player by the closer and closer you get to independence. And that's also part of the reason why, you know, closer you get to independence, the more violence the, uh, there is in, uh, in the movement for independence. But suffice it to say, those are at least the two of the contradictions that occur. Um, and the, the thesis, I guess, that I'm going to try to lay out for you is the main reason why um, the conflict in India was so bloody, um, why there was so much sort of violence that took place in it, um, and why, at the end of the day, Gandhi couldn't offer real solutions to what, um, you know, why the violence was emerging, is because the Gandhi, Gandhian politics of nonviolence, at the end of the day, couldn't resolve the real reasons why people were out in the streets protesting. Um, the kinds of economic and social grievances that people were genuinely responding to, which Gandhi provided a platform for their expression of, at the end of the day, he had no real solutions to offer. Peasants who were starving, starving workers who were not getting paid wages, untouchables, now called Dalits, who are still uh, you know, embroiled in the caste system, Muslims who face discrimination, women who were unable to um, have full uh, uh, political participation. The Gandhian program offered no real solutions um, to these people, and it, it ended up becoming the sort of dominant theme in uh, the course of the independence movement. Gandhi would unleash these mass campaigns, people would then get a taste of what was possible when they were involved in mass political strategy. It would go beyond what Gandhi wanted to do, and he would clamp down on those protests time and again. The strategy was Gandhi would bring people out in the streets when they said, no, we don't just want what you're offering now, we want more, Gandhi would pull the strings on it. And what it produced was a kind of politics of dissatisfaction amongst the overwhelming majority of people, um, and led them to conclude, if you were Muslim, it led you to conclude that Hindu, Gandhi was a Hindu and would never offer anything good for the Hindus. If you, were, if you were a Hindu, it led you to conclude that Gandhi was in bed with the Muslims and wouldn't lead you, uh, wouldn't actually deliver on goods for the Hindus. And it set the stage for what in India is called communalism, or the violence between Hindus and Muslims in India. OK, so I just said that the reason why Gandhi can't solve this problem is because there are real economic grievances that people face. Um, so you have to understand what the British do to India to set up those economic grievances. India, before the British get there, is a largely peasant economy um, run by a bunch of princes and small prince states that are, you know, more uh, something like 200 or 300 prince states scattered across India at the time that the British, uh, British began their process of colonization. In order to more efficiently manage um, the country in 1857, the British began to change the commercial relations in the countryside, moving from an economy which is based in transactions in kind, you produce corn, you give it to, you give a certain section of it to the feudal lord or to the rent collector and you keep the rest, um, to a cash-based economy in which peasants have to pay both rent and taxes in order for uh, them to keep access to the land. What this ends up doing is within 60 years, it dispossesses half of the peasants off of the land. So the things that you see happening, for instance, in Mexico, after the imposition of NAFTA, where uh, um, peasants are driven off of their land and made landless, is a full-scale process happening in um, India between 1862 and 1900, roughly, um, more than 50% of the peasants are driven off the land as they're no longer able to pay rent and taxes, um, and they're unable to convert um, you know, their goods into sufficient enough cash for the market. The second thing that happens is that Britain is flooding um, India with 
uh, processed goods, especially textile goods, which were the largest, man I mean, the Industrial Revolution globally is essentially a revolution in textile production. But England is flooding the Indian market with goods that it's producing in Manchester and Lancashire. So the peasants who would be driven off the land would normally, in any other economic context, try to find work in the urban centers, usually in some kind of industry. That industry note doesn't exist because we have goods coming in from England. What this ends up doing is setting up massive amounts of unemployment in the cities, um, hardship in uh, the countryside, and a really oppressive economic arrangement in which the, they're called zamindars, you might think of them as landlords or tax collectors. Um, what the British would do is that in Hindu-dominated areas, they'd send in Muslims to be the landlords and tax collectors, and in Hindu-dominated areas, they'd do the opposite. Um, and this produced a kind of dynamic where the tension, the economic tension in the countryside was based by, uh, between Hindus and Muslims. The second thing that this does, um, and this is what's kind of interesting, because agricultural productivity um, and population growth ex grow at about the same time throughout the entirety of um, you know, British rule in India. So there's plenty of food to go around. But in the hundred years that uh, the British rule India, roughly, there's something like 60 famines, 60 major famines that take place in India with more than a million deaths in each of the famines. Um, before the British had come, the kind of economic arrangement in the countryside, um, you had a famine maybe once every 50 years. The famines were happening not because there wasn't enough food to go around, but because nobody had the money to buy the food from the market to consume it themselves. And so the, this not only produced, you know, first land dispossession, but then actual hunger and real social privation um, uh, throughout masses of people. In 1942, at the height of World War II, some six million Bengalis were starving and was the greatest famine that had hit India during British rule as the British are lifting you know, grain to, to, to fund the, uh, or to feed essentially the war effort during World War II um, and uh, at the same time you know, strafing uh, Bengal with their, with their bombs because people are, are protesting now in the streets. This condition, this sort of economic arrangement, produced resistance well before Gandhi had arrived. Um, so there would be peasant outbreaks. Um, there were also, famously in 1857, was a mutiny of soldiers of the East India Company um, about uh, economic arrangements, but also about um, military arrangements that uh, they were being subjected to. Um, there would have been massive uh, uh, protests that would take place, but all mostly locally. Um, so small sections of villages would rise up together to demand uh, an end to taxation or an end to rent, but they'd be brutally suppressed by uh, the British military. Um, this goes on for quite some time. I mean, so from between 1857 and 1917, roughly that 60-year period, um, there's something like 5,000 peasant uprisings against uh, the British, all of which involve some kind of military or violent component. That begins to change in 1885, um, which is the year that the Indian National Congress is founded. It is a collection at the time of um, clerks, lawyers, intellectuals, journalists, um, middle class Indians who had some amount of British education, so they would have all spoken English, which is how they could communicate to one another. India famously is a country with more languages than you can count. Um, uh, more languages than Europe and twice the population, right? So it's a massive kind of uh, social and linguistic uh, unit. But the Indian National Congress was composed of the middle class who were responding to two things. The first was the racism that they experienced by the British um, colonial experience, which prohibited them from reaching the same level of economic advancement as their white colleagues because the British had a ceiling on how far lawyers could advance or how far judges could advance if you were Indian. In fact, no white Britisher could be judged by a jury or a judge or um, by a prosecutor who was Indian. So any white person who ever came to trial in British colonial India could only have an all-white jury, prosecution, and judge. And so this, of course, put place sort of upward limits on how far Indians could go. And so they, they become the sort of base of the Indian National Congress. There's a, sec a third group, so we've talked about the peasants, we've talked about the sort of layer of the middle class. Um, there's a third group that also has now uh, beginning to express its grievances, and those are new um, industrial uh, workplaces that are, taking, that are developing in Calcutta and in Bombay and in Ahmedabad particularly. Small attempts by Indian and British industrial firms to develop steel production, the railways that are laid in India during British rule, all of the steel comes from indigenous, um, uh, indigenous production. It's actually pretty expensive to ship the steel in from Britain, so they make it here. Um, the same thing begins to be true of textile and jute, right? So sandbags that are made for World War I and World War II from jute material, that helps to grow some industrial production. And then uh, uh, most sort of um, 
you know, the, the beginnings of some construction industry as well in these cities. Um, the workers are in these factories are denied union rights by the British colonial regime. Wages are kept abysmally low. And so you have a series now of strikes that are breaking out as people attempt to organize and fight for better living conditions. And then the fourth, and this is what's kind of interesting about India, is there's a section of these industrialists and business classes who are opposed to British rule because they don't like the tariffs that the British are imposing, which limit their economic arrangement. So what Gandhi is famously able to do that nobody before him had done was find a way to unite those four grievances together by pitting those economic grievances and, and saying that they were entirely related to British colonial rule. So talking about the peasantry's um, is it Sandberg? Her, yeah, Sandberg, who famously says that India must be bled dry, by which he means, you know, all of the wealth from the land will be taken. Um, uh, so you unite the peasantry with the middle class under the banner of the Indian National Congress, with the working class by saying, we will give you more civil liberties so that you can organize unions, with the industrialists by saying, once we have control over our own country, the tariffs will be lifted. Um, and it produced now, for the first time, a kind of nationalist belief that every class could have a stake in India getting its independence from Britain, um, and you know, moving forward and marching together in a campaign uh, that would begin to show how nationalism could be meaningful. Here's the problem, and anybody who's studied at all political economy knows this. Um, you can, for a while, operate on the belief that industrialists and workers have common aims, but as long as the economic arrangement is what the wages are paid on the shop floor, how many benefits you have, there's a certain antagonism that emerges every time uh, workers demand more uh, uh, wages or benefits from the bosses. There's a certain antagonism that emerges every time peasants demand more in terms of um, you know, less rents, less taxes, or more, uh, uh, more uh, return for the product that they're bringing on the market. The coalition that Gandhi created sort of imagined, imagined itself as suturing all of these economic antagonisms together, but the more and more people came into activity and the more they began to feel you know, the strength in their own legs and numbers to demand more, the more it brought those fissures and antagonisms out into the open. And added to that was a problem that Gandhi's actual political program um, was not what anybody really wanted. I don't know how many of you have read Hint Swaraj, his famous sort of his famous uh, pamphlet on what his demands are. For, how many of you read the autobiography, The Experiments with Truth? Okay, no, it's okay, it's totally okay. I, usually those, somebody's read it in the audience because it's always sold in Barnes and & Noble and you still get access to at least that bit of Gandhi. But here's what he says in Hind Swaraj in 1919, and this is what he wants for India. India's salvation consists in unlearning what she has learned during the last 50 years. The railways, telegraphs, hospitals, lawyers, doctors, schools, and such like all have to go. And the so-called upper class have to, have, to, have to learn to live conscientiously and religiously and deliberately the simple life of a peasant. Now, there's one aspect of that that you can all understand, right? Which is that industrialism is awful, it's environmentally devastating, um, the schools are teaching you, you know, to love the British, <laughs> these have got to go, etc. But to demand that all of us give up all of our possessions, return to the countryside, and live the way that the starving peasants are living is a pretty radical notion that not everybody was behind. In fact, I don't think anybody was actually behind this part of Gandhi's program, right? What they were behind was the idea that you could unite collectively to fight against the British, but you know, Gandhi's famously opposed to things like modern science and railways and you know, thinks that you should go back and live very, very humble and simple lives, which could have been attractive to, I guess, a certain section of the intelligentsia, but the peasants were already living that life and they hated it, right? They wanted, they wanted modern things, they wanted access to education, better jobs, um, science, etc. This kind of program didn't actually offer uh, the majority of people who were poor in India, the overwhelming majority of people who were poor in India at the time, anything really to hang their hats on. The reason why Gandhi sort of campaigns for uh, nonviolence are successful, and the first major campaign is in 1920 to 1922, it's called the Non-Cooperation Movement. It brings millions of Indians out into the streets. It's because he's able to give you symbols and strategies for how to act against your common grievances. He says, it's the British who are bleeding India dry, we must go and protest the British. It's bleeding the workers dry, it's bleeding the uh, peasants dry, and it's massively successful. Added to that, in 1919, excuse me, I'm going to water bottle, can you talk to me? It was a mistake, I just remembered. Um, in 1919, the British passed this thing called the Rowlett Act, which is a massive, I mean, whatever you think of the Patriot Act um, and its kind of repression of civil liberties in the United States, the Rowlett Act is much, much worse. It bans all gatherings of 10 or more people. It forces Indians to crawl on their hands and knees. 
um, any time a British soldier is seen approaching, um, you know, it, just massive restrictions on civil liberties, curbs the press, locking up political leaders. It's passed in 1919, and uh, a curfew is passed uh, alongside the Rowlett Act to, to stop uh, people from organizing. Famously, in Amritsar, in the Punjab, in Jallianwalabad, some thousand people gather to talk about what is going on with the curfew. It's called as a non-violent uh, uh, meeting. Um, General Dyer, the person in charge of the garrison at Amritsar, calls out the troops. Jallianwalabad, by the way, is like a park with walls on all sides. Um, and so people went into sort of a, a large square to convene and talk. Um, and also people were there for picnic, I mean the park, right? So people were there for picnicking and for other sort of reasons. Dyer lines up the top of the four walls with machine guns and strafes the entire crowd, killing 400 people. It's just an out and out massacre. Um, this, more than anything else, convinces the whole of India that the British have nothing um, meaningful to offer Indians and that some kind of campaign of resistance has to be organized, which is why, I mean, after that example, there are major strikes that break out in the cities, people are protesting massively, and the campaign in 1920 and 22 is extraordinary. I mean, it's, it's beyond what Gandhi could have imagined. In fact, it becomes so um, dynamic that in 1922, in a small town in the United Provinces called Chori Chora, peasants were uprising against the excessive tax collection that they were facing. They too were attacked by the police. They chased the police, I mean you can imagine, hundreds of police, uh, sorry, hundreds of, of, of peasants, maybe 20 police officers, they're chased back into the police station. And in a fit of passion, the Indians burned down the police station with the, with the police inside, killing 22 police, police officers. The British then round up all of the peasants, some 100 of them are tried, some 19 of them are convicted and charged with the death penalty, and Gandhi says that if he had been the British, he would have ordered their executions too. Uh, his belief was that the, the movement had to remain nonviolent, it had to remain uh, nonviolent, particularly because what he wanted to solidify was the idea that peasants and landlords, workers and industrialists could actually work together. And the first time that peasants demanded more or took sort of violent action against what were actually draconian police officers in the United Provinces, Gandhi calls off the movement. And so in 1922, at the height of the struggle of the mass campaigns against the British, Gandhi says no, and the movement goes back into retreat. And in fact, this, this movement in 1922, most historians um, uh, 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 write about it as Gandhi proving his ability as a national leader to turn the spigot of protest on and off very, very successfully for the first time. Right? He's able to convince people when to go out and when to come back because of his kind of charismatic and popular campaign. And he does. I mean, he's able to, he transforms the Congress Party from a group of, I, I don't know what to call it, basically a, a debating circle of you know, middle class types. Um, not the most exciting thing in the world, um, 1885, but by 1920, it's a mass party with hundreds of thousands of members. It's actually Gandhi's organizational genius which grows the Congress Party to uh, the size that it is, but it also allows him to operate the levers of power when it comes to the movement's ability to grow and shrink. In 1922, um, numbers, I mean, huge numbers of people are utterly disenchanted with what Gandhi has done. Most famously in the Punjab, a young man named Bhagat Singh, who was radicalized by the events of Jallianwala Bagh and joined Gandhi's protest, sees what Gandhi does by calling off the movement for independence. Um, his uncle, by the way, had been hanged by the British, and he becomes a revolutionary um, in 1922 when Gandhi uh, calls off the movement um, at that time. Okay, so between 1922 and independence, a few things are happening which are changing the political uh, dynamic inside of India. The first is that World War I has happened, and a bit of history that you may or may not know famously, more than a million Indians fight for the British in World War I. Um, they're fighting mostly in the European theater and in the Middle East. In fact, the conquest of Mesopotamia that the British are able to do in World War I is done mostly with Indian soldiers uh, fighting for them. But they are experiencing equality on the battlefield, but they come back home to discriminatory experiences, and this begins to change their views of what is possible. This is not unlike, by the way, the experience of black soldiers in World War II coming back home and seeing Jim Crow laws you know, in existence here, and then drawing sort of black power conclusions as a consequence. The second thing that has happened is the Russian Revolution has happened, um, and in many ways, sort of socialist politics are beginning to trickle into India, and people are talking about other ways that they might begin to organize. And then the third thing that is beginning to happen is the trade unions are beginning to grow in a big way. The working class in India is quite small. In the, in the 1920s, it's maybe 3 million people in a country of 300 million people. Um, but 
at the height of the strike wave activity, 90% um, of all industrial workers are on strike, and that's in 1942. So you can see the beginnings of some sort of organization uh, taking place here. Okay. Most famously, if you know one thing about Gandhi, or if you've seen one of his sort of non-violence campaigns, it's the 1930 March to the Sea, the, salt, the famous Salt March, where he defies the British ban on, on salt, or the British taxation on salt, and you know, argues for indigenous production of salt by people going to the oceans and manufacturing their own salt. Um, millions of people participate in this kind of very innocent, I think, innocent act of civil disobedience. Uh, if there's one thing that we all need to survive, it is salt. I mean, in addition to water, right? you need sort of salt to survive. It's also basic uh, food stuff. Um, but peasants, workers, etc., are following Gandhi's example and leading this. In 1930, Gandhi promises um, a fight to the finish, meaning that in 1930 he will continue either the hunger striking or the civil disobedience campaigns until they finish. But in 1931, Gandhi actually calls off the movement yet again um, when the British offer some piecemeal electoral reforms, giving what is then called, I, I can do some of the constitutional history if you care, but it's called devolution, which basically means they're going to give some new powers to the local administration and the Indians can run the local administration. They're not going to give them any money to do anything with that, but you know, you can have sort of titular power at the municipal level and that would be one way. And Gandhi settles for this kind of municipal devolution as opposed to full-fledged independence in 1931. When you say fight to the finish and you deliver only piecemeal reforms, it can be quite, dis I mean, this might have been your experience too, was definitely uh, some of our experiences in either this country with the occupied movement sort of bursting onto the stage and people feeling like something was really possible, or even the movement in Madison, Wisconsin, where trade unionists were challenging Scott Walker's attempt at eliminating all public sector unions. It felt like something was possible, and when you can't deliver on that promise, people began to draw certain conclusions about what can actually be done. Um, it's at this moment that the mass right-wing parties in India began to grow substantially, because Hindus are able to say to other Hindus, Gandhi will never deliver for you, he's too much in bed with the Muslims, so a right-wing organization called the Hindu Mahasabha, which literally means the Greater Council of Hindus, develops. Um, I'll fast forward to the end. Uh, the Hindu Mahasabha is the group that trains the guy who assassinates Gandhi um, soon after independence. So that right-wing formation grows massively in the 1930s. The other uh, uh, conservative organization that grows at this time is the Muslim League, who is able to convince a section of uh, India's Muslims that as long as they remain in India, the Hindus will be the majority, they will have no protections, and they need to organize separately. And in fact, it's about this time at a Muslim League conference that the demand for what's called the two-nation theory, the idea that India was actually two countries, not just one, one that was Muslim and one that was Hindu, was promulgated. Now, mind you, these were not um, the lived experience of most Muslims and Hindus. Most Muslims and Hindus lived in communities next to each other. Um, they worked next to each other. They went to schools, in many instances, next to each other. Um, this was only a kind of political explanation that made sense in the decline of the movement as Gandhi turned, uh, turned on uh, 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 the turned off the spigot and told people to go home. You needed an explanation for that. And, and in that confusion was the birth of these sort of right-wing organizations. So between 1930 and 1940, you actually have a wave of communal riots that take place, Hindus against Muslims, excuse me, all over the countryside and Uttar Pradesh being taken, taking place. The only real place where Hindus and Muslims are organizing collectively together, there are two of them, one is inside the army, because the army is actually relatively integrated, and the second place is in the shop floor, so um, the textile mills, the steel mills, the other industrial locations in Bombay, Calcutta, Ahmedabad, are the places where they're actually still uh, working together. Okay, um, the story that I'm going to cut now to is why the British actually leave India. Um, and it's not because of Gandhi's campaigns. Um, by 1947, three things have happened which now limit the British's ability to rule uh, the empire, um, and they affect um, the decision-making calculus. And they also explain why, when they leave, um, they set in motion you know, sort of uh, uh, communal violence. They have the ability to stop. Um, they actually uh, don't allow it to uh, uh, succeed. The first is that um, the cost of running an empire has become incredibly expensive. Um, Britain has taken a huge hit in World War II. It no longer has the military capacity to rule India in any substantial way. The exchequer is run dry. And in fact, oddly enough, if you will believe it, they owe India money because they've used um, tax revenue that India has collected to fund the World War II effort. So they're actually in debt to India. One of the terms of independence in 1947 is a forgiveness of the debt so that Britain will no longer be in the red. Uh, 
The second reason um, that they leave in 1947 when they do is that there's a massive mutiny taking place within the Royal Indian Navy and the Royal Indian Air Force. Some 500,000 soldiers and pilots are on strike refusing to fight. Um, and this convinces the, in, uh, the British that if they don't leave now, um, they may have a more serious military confrontation on their hands. And then the third reason um, that they leave is that they're able, to, they're able to cut a deal with both the Muslim League and the Congress Party to basically be their junior partners in the region. Um, both of them will now be part of the Commonwealth of Nations. They will both carry out and be loyal to the crown in matters of foreign policy. And so they were able to win um, the leadership of those countries to play the same role that Britain needed them to play in this region. Um, suffice it to say, the movement in 1947, um, and 1946 and 1947, is massively violent and chaotic. Um, the extent of how, how, in, how much India had been bled dry during World War II forces people to take some really radical actions. In 1946 alone, there's something like 300 terrorist attacks, um, 600 bombs are exploded in major urban centers, 200 plus train tracks are, are ripped up to shreds, Post offices are attacked, police stations are attacked, there's a massive amount of social upheaval that is taking place in India, and Gandhi is receding further and further into the background. Congress then is forced to agree to partition because it has no way of managing the social crisis. It's unable to say to the peasants, we will give you your land. It's unable to say to the workers, we will give you better wages. It's in fact unable to do anything except manage the crisis by splitting the country and pushing you know, Muslims into one direction and Hindus into another direction, and it does, in fact, lead to some of the, I mean, the bloodiest, um, bloodiest way that you can think about um, uh, partition happening. I think this, is, this, this story forces us at least to then ask the questions about why we might want to uh, put nonviolence in a historical context rather than as a kind of moral imperative that we as social justice activists commit ourselves to. Nonviolence certainly is able to do some pretty spectacular things. In fact, the issue of India's independence does not become an international issue without the kinds of spectacular nonviolence that Gandhi is able to pull together. These big protests actually make the world think about, and you know, the League of Nations debates this, the United Nations debates you know, what to do with the Indian independence problem because they know what you know, Indians actually want because there are millions of them in the street demanding it. Nonviolence played an important role in the building up of the cause and the, the elevation of it to an international level um, uh, in, in ways that would not have been possible uh, without it. It also united a big chunk of disparate interests to have common cause together to fight the British. At the end of the day, though, the inability of a program of Gandhi's sort of politics to offer real solutions to the grievances which were bringing people out of the street meant that the movement was bound to fracture. And if you didn't have politics which could contain that fracture, it was in fact the religious right that benefited from that fracturing. Um, if you want an American analog, the inability in some ways to contain the social crisis here in this country has led to the formation of now what is, I, I think, some of the goofiest politics that go under the name of the Tea Party in this country. Um, as we're unable to offer, re I mean, so, so that somebody can stand up and say, get your government hands off my Medicare, right? That sort of nonsense, which is the way that people understand what is happening at the halls of power, happens because there's no force in this country offering people a real solution to the austerity, uh, to the uh, lack of social, that social services that they face in this country. It forces them into farther and farther right-wing and even more religiously based solutions because those at least offer clear explanations of why things are happening and what to do about them. In places like um, Greece, for instance, you've seen the massive rise of Golden Dawn, a fascistic party as the Greek government is unable to contain the austerity crisis. Um, and in places like England and France, you know, more traditional Nazi parties are again on the rise. That's what happened in India. The inability of the leadership of politically to offer real solutions to the economic grievances led actually to the movement cannibalizing itself in certain ways. And uh, the building up of two nations, now India and Pakistan, required a whole lot of uh, uh, political, economic, and social repression as new governments came to power. And that's just a story at the economic level. I can tell you the story too of how Hyderabad, a giant print state in the central part of India, was forced to become part of the Indian Union. The Indian government sent in troops in the 1950s to suppress the uprising there when uh, the people in Hyderabad wanted independence from the Indian government. Or probably the greatest ongoing tragedy in India today is what was done in Kashmir when Jawaharlal Nehru in the 1950s sent in the troops and forcibly occupied Kashmir after having promised the, uh, the people there the right to self-determination if they so wanted it. That there were parts of now of the Indian apparatus state which in order to you know, deliver on some kind of economic program for especially uh, the rich in the country uh, managed to do some pretty outstandingly horrible things. 
All of which is to say that the story about Nehemiah Gandhi, about nonviolence, and about India has been used to lead activists to certain conclusions about what kinds of tactics are appropriate and inappropriate as we fight for social justice in this country. I think we want to take um, the best parts of the Gandhi story. There's, there are many, many, many things to admire about Gandhi. Um, I didn't say this at the beginning, but I was kind of raised on the Gandhi mythology. Um, I went to Sunday school for 10 years in the Mahatma Gandhi Community Center in Houston. I did my junior high school fair, history fair project on Gandhi. I mean, I was a product really of the Gandhi mythology. I have no, no uh, 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 shortage of admiration for some of the really incredible things that he did. But at the end of the day, a campaign for social justice has to ask, how do we win? Um, and the truth of the matter is that when you know, judging by the balance sheet of Gandhi's actual record, the victories that are accomplished in those campaigns are very, very few. And the possibilities for real victories, for real redress of economic grievances, requires a far more radical, um, I think, set of politics and tactics and a more flexible understanding of what the state is willing to do um, and how you combat that in uh, you know, real situations. So I, I'm, I hope that this was a provocative conversation. Um, I hope that we can have a you know, useful discussion about what we think about nonviolence and what you think about various campaigns for nonviolence, but at a minimum, I thought I'd be remiss if I gave you the sort of standard version that you've heard over and over again of the you know, civil disobedience, moral force, political persuasion, et cetera, leading to the utopian vision of a free India. Um, all parts of that story are wrong. And as social justice activists who want to speak truth to power, we need to understand both why that story is told repeatedly to us and then how to implement the revisions to that story in our own practice as we begin to contend with, I think, taking on you know, some of the most uh, egregious ex excesses of power here in this country, um, the things that the Obama administration has been able to get away with because we refuse to challenge you know, imperialism in a black face in a way we, wouldn't challenge, we would challenge imperialism in a white face, I think require us to ask very, very hard questions about what it will take to stop the American war machine, even if you want basic things like a stop to privatization here at New Mexico State University, what will it take um, to do something like this, because we have the historical record. If you follow even some of the protests that happened in Berkeley and in California two or three years ago, um, they used all kinds of force against peaceful student protesters. Police spray, rubber bullets, all of it was used against peaceful students by university police forces. That is what they are willing to do to defend their economic interests. We have to ask, what are we willing to do to make sure that we can win those confrontations and get to a place in which violence is no longer part of our society because injustice is the only thing which requires violence to defend it. Justice never, never does. So thanks very much. Second is that they're being asked to run campaigns in the other parts of the British imperial uh, domain. So they're being asked to um, help police things in Africa and in Southeast Asia, and they're unwilling to do so. Um, one of the things that India provided was the, was basically a giant military base to uh, control all parts of the empire around the Indian Ocean. And by 1946, soldiers were sort of fed up with doing that work for them. Okay. And the second question. Um, You've obviously thought a lot about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was in Madison. Okay. Um, and I told some, a few of the people in this, in this room, as we actually, that um, I walked into the Capitol Dome. At the height when it was. Right fun. when they started to chant, um, tell me what democracy looks like. Yeah. And actually got tears. Of course, out. yeah. Um, and there were masses of people, wonderful, regular old people, yeah. teachers, and firemen, and et cetera. Et cetera. Construction workers right. coming in uniform. Right, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Um, and it was a huge number of people, and we were sure something was going to happen, right? Yeah, we were all sure. It was our Tower Square, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it did. And it did. OK, well, one thing did happen. I have to say. Okay. I just knew that there were lots and lots of other people who cared about these things like I did. Right. We're not alone. Right. Okay. But what do you think 
Is there more that could have been done to change it? If the tactic had not been to have nine Democratic state legislators escape the country, go to Illinois to avoid this vote, if the fight had actually been general strike in Madison until we win full collective bargaining rights for the union, the picture looks very, very differently. Because the tempo is not set by Democratic Party politicians caving in to a vote to Scott Walker and then running a, a really, I mean, a dismally poor recall campaign in the months that follow it. If it's actually those people who are excited, who have real grievances that they're trying to express and not sort of people at the top cutting wheels to make certain outcomes happen, then we're talking about a different dynamic in like 1931. Well, it looks more like the Chicago Teachers Union, right? Think about the Chicago Teachers Union, which also wages a massive historical fight to win public education. Uh, they're unwilling to let, you know, the Democrats who run the city of Chicago tell them what to do. And it changes the dynamic. They actually win. That's the difference, I think, here. Gandhi was closer in line to, you know, the kinds of Democratic Party politicians who say very, very good things, but in practice offer very, very little to people who care about it. And Madison moment was incredible. I think we were also inspired by it. There were, not just here, right, in Tahrir Square, they were chanting, go Madison, and, you know, and I don't say Madison, you had, like, actually, I mean, I think, like, 10 years ago, the sort of trade union conservatism in this country, um, Islamophobia would have run pretty deep in many of these construction workers. But they were all chanting, you know, like, walk like an Egyptian right through the capital, but it changed things massively. Uh, when it was a real sort of inspiring moment. If you can imagine that in India, it would have been, you know, marching, going to a protest and seeing um, Dalits or untouchables next to Hindus, next to Muslims. I mean, all together in one giant march, the feeling of solidarity would have been unreal in terms of what you can imagine. Um, the best expression of that, by the way, if you care, this is me being an English professor, is uh, Mulkaraj Anand's novel, A Touchable, in which he describes some of these mass protest campaigns, just beautiful de depictions of what, um, what happened in the 1920s and 1930s in India. Somebody's got to disagree with you. Somebody's got to disagree with you. It's just the same as Do you have a question, Mark? No, I'll go ahead. Well, okay. So, I admire, you know, everything that you're saying. I think you're incredibly well educated on the topic. And I'm, I'm it's, a, it's a product of being born Indian in this country. <laughs> you have all, all these stuff thrown at you, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, the thing that, you know, the bigger question that um, I can't really get over is, you know, how can adding violence or adding aggression to a situation where there's violence and aggression, you know, create a subtotal that doesn't have more violence and aggression? You sure. Know, like, I, I just philosophically can't get over it. The thing that I'm saying is not that you add violence to every political campaign. The thing that I'm saying is that we have, as a movement, to be prepared for what kinds of violence can be done against us and be prepared to think about what we want to do when that moment happens. Right? Um, if you begin with the notion that the rich do not give up their power, their wealth, their privilege voluntarily, then it forces you to ask a different question about how a campaign is going to go if it wants to win. What is a strike? A strike is not a nonviolent thing. A strike is you preventing people from taking your, replacing you on the job line by marching militantly and, and blocking the doors and keeping people from coming in and taking your job. It's a question of violence. In some ways limited, what happens when the police come to bust your strike? You have to talk about how you defend yourself. Now, the goal is not to um, argue for a sort of Black Panther style, everybody arm themselves and wage urban warfare. That is, please, but do not take that to be what I'm saying. If you, you know, if you represent this talk to say that, I'll get into a whole lot of trouble, I'm sure. Um, but what I am saying is that the principle of nonviolence, what it ends up doing in social justice movements, is prevents that conversation from even beginning about how we defend ourselves. Right? Um, think about what slavery was in this country. It was an incredibly oppressive economic arrangement which turned human beings into property. The only way to liberate the slaves and end the institution of slavery was massive amounts of violence. And I don't say that lightly. I mean, like, that, the Civil War was um, an incredibly violent and yet incredibly necessary historical moment if you wanted to end slavery in this country because the agrarian South would have held on to their slaves to their death, and in fact, that's what the Confederacy was prepared to do. 
right? So to talk about things like massive social changes when economic, economic exploitation exists at that level requires you to think about broader questions and some, I mean, you know, in some ways what the slaves were doing in the march in the Union Army was self-defense more than was violence. It was a refusal to be part of anything that would prevent them or to, would require them to go back to slavery situations in the South. I'm just, I'm not saying that we um, began now planning the insurrection by a, taking a gun. I'm saying that as a movement, we began tactically and uh, being more flexible tactically by thinking about what kinds of responses are necessary to what we know will be state repression when that happens. Think about like, you know, if you were in Egypt or if you're in Syria right now, right, the question of violence is not a simple incidental question. It's a life or death question of how you defend yourself against what the Syrian regime is doing. I think of it closer to self-defense than I think of it to aggression, right? As a movement, you've got to be prepared to fight when these questions arise. Um, our inability to get to successful tactics is one of the reasons why the Occupy movement disappeared as quickly as it did. The police came in and cleared out all of the city halls that were being occupied, city hall, you know, public places in front of city halls were being occupied. And the movement was completely unable to figure out how to organize the protest. What about activists um, as, as an alternative? What about um, activists becoming a part of the political structure? Yeah. And you got a for instance? You got for instance? No. That's what I, is, is that an option? Uh, it is something that one could do. The question is whether or not we think that that's an effective way to win, I think is the real issue. Can you, can you maybe elaborate on why that's not um, What is the state, right? What is, what is the establishment? What is, uh, it depends on what you think the state is. I think of the state as an institution which has two things going for it. It has a monopoly on the means of violence, which means they control the guns, i.e. the police, um, and the prisons, and the jails, etc. And they have a military and a national guard, etc. All of those are legal, and the state controls them. And it's a bureaucracy, which means they get to make the laws. Um, as an institution, it is designed to preserve the economic arrangement that exists, not to preserve it. So it's designed, in fact, to allow uh, certain kinds of rights and privileges to continue to exist in any kind of economic arrangement, not to dismantle them. So ask yourself, why it is that in every strike situation, the cops always side with the bosses and never with the workers? In every strike. There's not, I, to, to date, if you know of a strike in which the cops sided with the workers instead of the bosses, I would love to hear it. But every single one, the job of the state is to enforce property rights and the rights of the bosses to keep and own you know, their property and not the workers to have access to jobs or better pay or anything. So in each instance, it would seem to me that people who become part of the state establishment without actually changing the economic arrangements that we, are, we all live in, end up in one way or another participating in different kinds of things which preserve those economic arrangements. I think it's very, very hard to unsettle them. I mean, you can make individual reforms. I think like, the fight for right now, um, the fight for public education is a really important one. And insofar as there are legislators who are fighting for them, I want to be on their side. But the reason why public education is disappearing is not because we have bad political legislators. It's because we have a taxation system in this country which refuses to fully fund public education. And that's an economic arrangement that the state is unwilling to do anything about. I tell this story to my students, and I don't know if it works here in New Mexico State, but I graduated from public high school in Texas in 1993, and tuition at the University of Texas in 1993 was $500 a semester. That seems to me what affordable public education, I think it should be free, mind you, but $500 a semester is what we could do in 1993. Now, a semester at the University of Texas costs $5,000 a semester in the course of 20 years. That's a thousand percent, is that right? Thousand percent inflation? Thousand percent inflation. You're not getting a thousand percent more from your degree. Um, and the, the, the entirety of that, I mean, it's, it also outstrips actual inflation over those last 20 years. Um, and the entirety of that is basically the shifting of the burden of paying for public education from corporate taxes in Texas onto individual families sending students to schools, which is also why public debt has skyrocketed, you know, personal debt has skyrocketed. So if you aren't able to transform the economic arrangements, getting into positions of power doesn't really do anything. This is Gandhi's problem, right? Gandhi wants, he cares about the poor. He desperately cares about the poor. But an unwillingness to change the economic structure of what is happening in the countryside means that peasants are going to get screwed over every time a rent collector comes to you know, demand rent. 
So it depends on what you want to accomplish. I mean, like if you want to have you know, individual changes take place, it's, I, I'm all for it. I'm all for people fighting in whatever ways they can fight. But I think that um, we ought to pause and think about what the aims of our you know, radical activism or social activism actually are. Um, there are fewer examples of that being done through entering the state and implementing that. <coughs> Even though it seems like the shortest way for us to implement change, there's fewer and fewer of them being implemented. Um, I just wanted to point out that there's a difference between the state I appreciate that. Yes. English professor in me loves that. And in Ohio, I think you would call it about 1972, I work in a state institution for the development of the industry. Now there were direct care staff, then there were real men, and then there were bosses. The bosses. And then there was the state. Great. It was a state institution. They paid the uh, care provider. So the union came in to organize, and they did it. They went on strike. The rest of us knew that the strike was not going to be successful unless the rest of us got behind them. Right. And we couldn't actually walk out of the buildings because there were people who couldn't take care of themselves in the building. Right. So what we did as a community, the workers on strike and the kind of mental management that I was, we created a back door. And we would go in the back door, it was like going through a cow path. <laughs> I mean, literally, a back door. And the state paid us over at our higher weight. And all of us covenant with each other to donate every cent of overtime to the strikers so that they could maintain their strike and that their strike wouldn't be broken. They got raises. But it was it was a very, very, very hard time. Absolutely. Because those people out on the line were outside were always being confronted by the police. Right. And those of us inside we're doing a job that was impossible. Right. To do. Doing the work of like seven or eight people yourselves. Well, if, we if, tried 15 or 15 20. Or okay. 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 Developmentally disabled. Right. 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 Okay. Right. So it was a whole, but we did it as a community of people. And I think that's what it takes is that people begin to understand that we really are in this together. Right. And there are some things that I can do from my position that actually supports other folks, and we can be, we can do things through the back door. And if we have to go through cow pastures, we can do that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've done worse. We can't get changes too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Can I give you a really cool example that maybe it's along the same lines? In uh, 1926 in Calcutta, um, the untouchables who clean out the latrines, and mind you, there's no public sanitation, so we're actually talking about manual scavenging of excrement. Um, they go on strike. And um, the entire city of Calcutta for three weeks begins to smell profoundly bad. Um, the police come and attempt to enforce the, you know, untouchables, the let's going back to work. And the women um, in, who have been manual scavenging began to pick up the excrement and throw it at the police as a their form of social protest for what is happening. The most successful strike in the history of the <laughs> They win within two days of that you know, protest being happening. Sort of, we are able to go through a whole lot of stuff, Cal Patty's being maybe the you know, mildest of the stuff that we go through to win you know, campaigns for social justice. Well, they do it in every day, right? That was their job, it was manual scavenging. And that's the sort of point of the story. It's like, the things that we think of as undignified, actually in different moments, can provide us extraordinary amounts of dignity. You know, um, walking through cow paddocks, for example, I imagine is an incredibly dignified act when you're doing it in support of a strike that was taking place. I want to get back to something you said of 
a few minutes ago. It's something about public education is disappearing because it's funded with tax dollars. Because they're refusing to fund it with tax dollars. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, corporate tax doesn't that particular. go then back to the politicians? Sorry? That then that goes back to the politicians who refuse to fund. Right, because the, the tax base in most states uh, that has declined in the last 25 years. Um, we've all seen property taxes go up. They have no problem doing that. It's a corporate tax base that's declined. And who funds the campaigns to get elected at the state legislative right. level is corporations, right? So that's the where the connection between economic power and the state prevents real solutions for public education from happening. Texas may be unique. I don't know what the corporate tax rate is in New Mexico, but in Texas, the corporate tax rate is 0%. Right? And um, Perry has sort of um, attempted to reduce the budget over slashing and slashing social spending. He's created this thing called the Rainy Day Fund, which is supposed to bail out the budget in case of overspending. What it basically is, is a pool of money collected from uh, uh, property taxes that he doles out to corporations so that they will come to Texas and then get the 0% corporate tax rate. So this is kind of, you know, double, triple scam, if you will. And meanwhile, schools are closing left and right in Texas. Um, I think I do disagree with part of what you said. But you, kind of, you kind of answered yourself too. You know, um, even better. Gandhi has been trivialized just like uh, King and Cesar Chavez have been trivialized uh, here. They're employed in a way that it makes them seem they uh, haven't accomplished anything. But I don't think Gandhi's contribution is nonviolence as a tactic. Because you also pointed out how we got people thinking. You know, there's physical violence in the street, which is easy to see. There's structural violence in the way when you set up uh, taxes and oppression of various kinds, economic and social. But there's also the symbolic violence. And he opened up so much for people to think about how the system works. To me, that's his contribution. Except it's a contradictory contribution, right? So on the one hand, he's able to speak to millions of people and get them to think about politics and economics in ways that they've never done before, able to exercise their own power in ways that they've never done before. That is very good. This is the part of nonviolence campaigns that is excellent. The problem is, is that the commitment, the principle of nonviolence, also then says to the same people, stop, you've done wrong, you've committed violence, you must go back. That nonviolence is put actually ahead of things that we might call consciousness raising, empowerment, um, broadening people's political horizons, or radicalization in the sort of discourse of the 1960s. So he sets the stage for all those things to happen, but his political emphasis is not actually in the continuation of that process, but in the foreshortening of it. Right? So his major contribution as head of the Indian National Congress is to short circuit that process rather than allow it to continue. So it's very contradictory. And if you want to credit him with the beginning stuff, which I perfectly agree with. The mass organizations in India are impossible without Gandhi's actual organizational and tactical genius. They're also limited by his political need to enforce a certain kind of politics on the entire Indian movement. So it's a push and a pull um, that puts, I think, the movement in a double bind that it can never get out of. It kind of seems like in both your examples, and you're again, I, you're kind of making analogies to the civil movement or uh, civil rights movement in America. Yeah. That uh, I guess Gandhi has to put it, or you know, Martin Luther King has to sort of uh, do the symbolic sort of raising consciousness, but there's no actual change until there's like an imminent threat to the state. So it almost seems like um, like the mainstream or whoever it is that, that, that you have to persuade to make, to make change happen has to be afraid of this imminent threat and then they have to go back and settle for the kind of nonviolence that uh, Gandhi was offering or Martin Luther King, I guess, in a way was off offering. So I don't, I don't see where you see, I don't know where, like, in, if we're trying to make an analogy to modern times, where that sort of imminent threat is going to come from. Um, I don't know, like, how you see, the, how you see these... The modern, or what, what do you see these uh, confrontations are going to take? Like, I don't know the I modern know. examples are not in the United States or in Egypt and in Tunisia and places like that currently. Right? That's what social processes that result in radical change are going to look like. Um, what's taking place in the United States is an embryo of something that will lead to that, potentially. Yeah. God forbid they stare to get anything worse than it is in this country, but you know, that's what it looks like the plan globally is to do in the country after country is to 
eviscerate social spending, force people to take it on the chin, work for longer and longer with less and less. Um, it'll, the confrontations will look closer to what they look like in Egypt and Indonesia. In fact, that's why it's spreading in all the places where the EU is the weakest right now, right? It's places like Portugal and Spain and Italy and Greece, where the sort of social crisis is developing in its kind of most profound ways. So uh, with us, with, with like sort of, I guess, disappointment with Occupy Wall Street, I mean, what is it going to take, I guess? Or, or is, it, is it just going to boil to a point like that? Also, eventually, or? Again, here's the thing. With, uh, I don't know how much Egyptian history you know, or even modern Egyptian history you know, but the Tahrir Square was not a spontaneous thing. It's the building of two decades worth of social justice organizing in Egypt um, that took place under really severe, really repressive conditions. So you had, for instance, the Kafaya movement, which was the pro-democracy demanding of electoral reforms in Egypt. You had the pro-Palestinian movement, largely the student comrade, uh, student uh, uh, folks uh, arguing for Palestine and rights for the Palestinians. You had a trade union movement in places like Mahatma al Hira, where underground unions were organizing. And you had probably the most spectacular women's movement anywhere in the Arab world uh, for the last 20 years doing some really heroic stuff to try to get women's rights in that country. Those things all come to a head when Tahrir Square happened. So it's not, it's not sort of like, the stuff that we're all involved in currently, all of the sort of social justice stuff that we're doing, whether it's fights around, you know, privatization, a union, um, the border wall, the immigration policies, the you know, fights around Iraq and Afghanistan. These issues we understand. I think we should understand the intimate connections that they all have, even if that's not always clear to larger chunks of the population. In decisive moments historically, those issues have opportunities to come together and express themselves. I think in much more, you know, spectacular ways. Um, my hope, actually, the, the thing that I'm sort of working um, on most. Um, uh, importantly right now, I think is this, the struggle to save public education. I actually think it's, a, it's one issue in which more people are affected, um, uh, more ordinary working class people, um, more people from you know, every kind of race imaginable affected by the closure of public schools. And we at least now have one example of a victory about how to stop the privatization of schools, and that's in Chicago teachers. So trying to get more things like that to happen, more active campaigns like that to happen. One of the ways that I see things progressing. But I'm in favor of all people working on whatever activist campaigns they can build. Because um, I'm, I'm fully confident that the lessons and the questions that you begin to ask, you know, allow us all to answer more questions about what a more just society would look like. Um, I know nothing, for instance, about permaculture. We spent some part of today talking about permaculture. I imagine a just society would have more permaculture. I want there to be, you know, more sustainable agriculture. It's not the thing that I know a whole lot about, so it's not like I'm going to but please, by all means, more permaculture. Those of you who want to go Any more questions? Um, I'm thinking in terms of what's happening in India right now, the ah. crisis it is in as a nation, um, the way of the multinational corporations are coming in and extracting. Um, things from the, the tribals, mining contracts and additional mining yeah, etc huh. and how the government is actually um, against its own people. Right, exactly. Um, my question is uh, I'm wondering after this interview what things that I mean I have been thinking in this direction for a uh, for a while as well. Um, is is it is it our I'm an Indian system? I I <laughs> where did it our covered huh. yeah. Um, is it our um, baggage of a sort that um, because we bought into this whole thing of um, non violence and non being and all that, you know, my, my parents get in the middle of all of us and so on, and then, my, then um, <coughs> the next generation were not Uh, idea that 
you were mentioning the beginning today that um, as those people can only be protest if they protest in a peaceful way, and the concept that we bought in data, they are middle class Indians. Yeah, but this is a really, it's a really and good point. And the government is using that and if that's actually part of what we inherited from this country thing. And then you add to that the encounter killings that happen when you do protest peacefully, yeah, right? Yeah. So, um, I'm not saying there is no violence, right, there is. Right. But not everything is malice what's going on in the side of the No, 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 absolutely. And uh, these are really extraordinary conditions that I think that as social justice movements we have to think very, very carefully about. I have more hope for India's urban areas than I've had ever in the past. The movement um, that grew after the rape case in Delhi was extraordinary. Um, blew the pants off the Anna Hazari nonsense, which was, had nothing to do with anything social justice related, in my opinion. Okay? That was basically the wrong call of India announcing itself to uh, the world. Uh, but that is a sort of incredible moment where middle class Indians are thinking about the social crisis and what to do about it. Now, not all the answers are good answers, some of the answers are funny answers. Um, Shah Bagh in Bangladesh is a slightly funny answer to a real social crisis in, um, in, in Bangladesh. Um, but there are ways that people are beginning to ask, I think, more profound questions. Um, the biggest problem that we face in India currently is a combination of three things. One is the absolute allegiance people have to the Indian military, given the sort of anti-Pakistani hysteria that's created for the last 60 years in the country. So the military can do no wrong. Our Javans are you know, good Shahids. We must you know, support them no matter what. This has created, I think, a kind of uncritical way of looking at things like terrorism, Kashmir, and uh, you know, Operation Green Hunt, which is what is happening in the The second problem, and then we should be honest about this as well, the official left in India has capitulated on all of these questions. Um, the Communist parties, the Socialist parties, etc., the things that people used to look to to provide moral and political guidance are not on the side of the people fighting, they're on the side of the state, which is also a confused matter. And the last thing to say about this is that in India, you actually have, for the first time, I think, the development of new political organs and new trade unions that are independent of the old left, the CPI, CBM, in India, that are now beginning to challenge these questions in a very interesting way. So I urge you to look at stuff um, from the new trade union initiative that's come out. There's some now three to 400 new unions that have sprung up in India, which are taking, as their principal charter demands, support for the tribal Adivasi region, support for independence for Kashmir. Yeah, these are, these are processes. They're not you know, solutions to uh, the things. But I'm hopeful because I can see the beginnings of new conversations taking place. Um, the numbers of students who will defend Arundhati Roy's right to speak about Kashmir or what's going on in Operation Green Hunt now as opposed to what it might have been 10 years ago. It's a, it's a, it's a change in some ways. It's not the perfect change that we would like to happen, but I, I began to think that more and more people think that the expenditure of money by the military to suppress tribal people so that mining corporations can get access to the land is a ridiculous waste of state money. And in a desperately poor country, more and more people will ask the question of why the money speaks for this.